This is the Homestead Journey Podcast, the podcast dedicated to the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. This is episode number 87 of the Homestead Journey Podcast. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us here on the Homestead Journey. My name is Brian Wells. I am coming to you from 3B Farm and Homestead here in beautiful upstate New York. And folks, it has been an absolutely busy week here on the Homestead. As you can imagine, it is certainly that time of the year where we just kick everything into high gear. And so without further ado, let's just jump right on into this week's Homestead Happenings. Let me start this week's Homestead Happenings off with a thumb update. So as you may recall from last week's episode, I ended up in the emergency room and got a couple of stitches in my right thumb. And folks, I just keep, I just keep being reminded over and over and over again how often you use your thumb how often you inadvertently bang your thumb and how bad it hurts when you've got stitches in that blessed thumb. And uh, so unfortunately, the thumb has not healed as quickly as I would like it to have. Uh, The part next to the thumbnail continues to bleed. I'm supposed to go tomorrow to get the stitches removed. And so I'm hoping they will be able to give me some ideas on what to do with the section next to the thumbnail because it just does not seem to be healing up like I would like. Now, in all fairness, I keep whacking the blessed thing. And it's just, again, it's amazing uh, how often you brush it up against stuff, even today I was driving the truck and I was doing, you know, kind of that crossover thing you do when you make a turn and whacked my thumb. And I thought I was just going to cry. It hurt so bad. Now, part of it may be that I'm just a wimp, but uh, it is amazing. Anyhow. uh, So that's the update on the thumb. On to more positive things. Let me give you a garden update. Folks, the garden, it's just starting to take off and it's so rewarding now to see that. Now, not everything is taking off like I would like it to. There are certain things that didn't sprout well. For example, my carrots, I just never get carrots to germinate well. And part of that's my fault. There are some techniques that people have with regards to getting carrots to germinate that I'm always saying, I'm going to try that. And then I just never do. So some of my carrots have come up well, some of them haven't. But by and large, things are really looking good in the garden. I'm very, very happy with it. I did finish uh, planting the Ruth Stout bed this week. Got some more peppers planted up there, some brassicas, um, some kale. I uh, did go ahead and uh, plant the, I don't remember if I had mentioned this on last week's podcast that I was going to plant uh, pole beans on some bean poles. There are actually some cane poles that came from my grandfather's house. And those are up this week. The squash and melons and the cucumbers uh, that I had planted up in the roost out bed are all up. And so I spent some time this week mulching the, that garden. And so hopefully uh, those things will continue to do well. And we'll just, we'll just see we've got it planted. Now it's a matter of making sure the weeds don't take over. And I actually did on this week's five minute Friday. If you haven't been listening to those, those are episodes that come out each Friday, as the name implies, they are five minutes or less, as the name implies, where I jump into a topic. And this week's topic was my three step plan for a weed free garden. So if you haven't listened to that, I will go ahead and include the link in the show notes, but uh, I've been trying to do my best to follow my three-step plan. And part of that was mulch, relying more heavily on mulch. And so I did spend some time in the roost out bed doing that. Yesterday and today, so yesterday being Saturday, today being Sunday, I 
spent a considerable amount of time around the raised beds, really knocking down the weeds. I took my weed whacker and pretty much went down to bare dirt. And then I put down weed barrier and I put down a new layer of wood chips. Uh, and it looks great. I have posted pictures to Instagram and Facebook. So if you don't follow us, the links are in the show notes, or if you just look for the Homestead Journey podcast on Instagram and Facebook, you will find us, follow us, and you will be up to date with what we're doing here on the Homestead. But I'm very, very happy with how that came out. Now, that was just step one of my process. Step two is going to be an experiment. And that is that I am going to put erosion fencing, which is that wooden snow fencing. I'm putting that up around the outside of my beds with a lower liner, we'll call it, of chicken wire to hopefully keep the deer and the rabbits out. Last year, I had a lot of problems with deer and rabbits. So I'm going to be putting that fencing up. Last year, you may remember, I did some poly wire. It wasn't electrified, uh, but I just did some poly wire around the garden to keep the deer out. That certainly doesn't deal with the rabbits and other small critters that want to get in there and wreak havoc on the garden. And it didn't look all that great, but it did seem like it was effective against the deer. So anyhow, I'm hoping this will look a little nicer. I'm just hoping that it's not going to throw too much shade. So we'll see how it all looks once we get it up. But that's the next step. So hopefully I'll be getting that done this week. And then finally, I had a bunch of transplants left over. I had a bunch of peppers and tomatoes. And a friend of mine reached out yesterday and said, hey, do you have any transplants left? And I said, well, actually, as a matter of fact, I do. And I was just getting ready to toss them all in the woods. And so she had some sunflowers and some herbs. And uh, so we worked out a bit of a trade. And so I was very thankful that those transplants didn't go to waste. And that's one of the things about being a homesteader, folks. It's great to interact with other homesteaders, barter with them. And uh, so it just made me feel good that I was able to help somebody else out. She was able to provide me with some things that I didn't have. And so it all worked out very, very well in the end. On to the animals. So I went ahead and moved the premier one poultry netting that I had around our meat birds. Obviously our meat birds have gone to freezer camp. And so I have moved them uh, to be around the mobile coop for our standard breed pullets. And so they got a taste of freedom for the first time this week. Now, honestly, folks, I have a love hate relationship with premier one poultry fencing. And I'm actually going to talk about that in a future episode, but uh, I will just tell you that it works well on flat ground, on uneven ground, on rocky ground. Uh, It does not install quite so well. And it's very frustrating to me, but we did get it up. And right now, unfortunately, the chickens are of a size where they can kind of run through the netting, which is frustrating, but it is what it is. As they grow, they won't be able to get through the netting. They'll stay where they're supposed to be. So right now we do have some chickens kind of running around that shouldn't be running around, but it is what it is. So we got that moved. Now, some exciting news this week on the homestead, and that is that Basil, she is the sow that I had put in with Boris, our unproven boar. She actually farrowed this week. And it it was just so exciting to see that. But before I get into that, Uh, What happened is on Thursday morning, when I went out to feed them, I looked at her and I thought, she looks like she's bagging up. Now, what I mean by that is it looked like her milk bar, (laughs) her teats were were swollen and only can be an indicator that they're getting ready to farrow. Now with her, I didn't really have a great date in mind as far as when she might farrow because I had seen them do the deed a couple of times and then nothing had happened. So I wasn't quite sure if Boris had kind of gotten things figured out. Um, If maybe he was shooting blanks, I just wasn't quite sure what was going on. But when I saw that she was bagging up, I made sure she had some fresh hay in the shelter. And sure enough, she got right in there and started making a nest. And so that evening, when I got home from an eye doctor's appointment where they had dilated my eyes and I couldn't see very well, (laughs) when I went to feed 
uh, Boris and Basil, she did not come out right away. So I hollered for Bonnie to come take a look. She looked from a distance into the shelter and she said, yes, I see three piglets in there. So I went ahead, grabbed my boots, hopped on over the fence, and I actually was able to do a live Facebook broadcast. I think it was live on just Facebook. I don't think it was on live on Instagram, but I was live on Facebook and was able to broadcast a live pig birthing. And so if you are interested in seeing piglets being born, that video is available over on our Facebook page. So definitely check that out. Uh, and again, if you're not following us on Facebook or Instagram, you're missing out. And so it was a lot of fun. Unfortunately, my phone was kind of running out of juice. So I had to run inside and charge it up and then head back out. So I didn't get everything that I wanted to, uh, but it was still so much fun to see that. And I'm just so excited about having those piglets here on the farm. That did mean that we had to play a little bit of pig Tetris because I did not want to leave her in with the boar. And I didn't want to leave her in, in with the boar for a couple of reasons. I was not worried that he would do anything to the piglets. Um, I felt like she would, she's a great mama. I felt like she would protect them. And he's a pretty, pretty chill boar. Anyhow, obviously you never know, but uh, I wasn't too worried about that. But my bigger concern was making sure that she gets enough feed. She is one of the sows that loses condition the fastest. In fact, many times I wean at six weeks with her instead of eight weeks, because it doesn't seem to matter how much feed I pump into her. She just loses condition very, very quickly. And so I wanted to make sure that Boris wasn't knocking her off the feed and was stealing all of that extra food. Unfortunately, when I first tried to make her move, she wanted nothing to do with it. Uh, I was trying to get her out of the pen. We have electric fencing there. So that's problem number one. When they know there's electric fencing, to get them to cross that, even though the electric fencing is not even there, they still aren't, they're still not too keen on the idea. And I don't have any of the plastic pig sorting boards to try to push her around. And so she spun around, she ran back into the shelter, she laid down and started uh, nursing. And so I knew that evening it was a lost cause. There was nothing that was going to change her mind. Um, and, and, and I'm happy that she's very protective of her piglets. She knows where her piglets are. She doesn't wanna leave her piglets. That's the sign of a good mother. That's what I want in a sow. But then the next day, um, we did get a little bit more, um, I don't want to say forceful with her because it wasn't like we were abusive towards her, but I was trying to use a board to try to push her around. And what I did is I actually ended up separating Boris out because that's the other thing. When you don't have the pig sorting boards, Boris is wanting to leave the pen, um, when you don't want him to. So what I did is I got her distracted with some food. I got into the pen. I got all the piglets into a tote put them outside. And then I got Boris to go in the, in the uh, shelter and I locked him in by screwing a board, uh, a piece of plywood over the opening. And then at that point I was just dealing with basil. And so I was eventually able to get her out. We used some bread to distract her and move her to the other pen and things have gone on well. So uh, I'm very, very happy with this litter. In fact, I posted on Facebook and Instagram a picture of Bonnie holding one of the piglets. Um, I did the in initial inspection of the piglets, and I was just so happy with this pairing. Uh, obviously, this is Boris's first time uh, siring a litter, so I wasn't quite sure what we were going to get, but uh, I was very, very happy with this litter. From a temperament perspective, it's probably the chillest group of piglets we've ever had on the farm. Um, from a confirmation perspective, they're great looking piglets, at least initially. We'll see how they, they grow out. But uh, overall, very, very happy um, with this group of piglets. Now, eight piglets were born. Unfortunately, only seven have survived. Um, but uh, she's doing a great job nursing them, being a mama, um, protecting them. And so I'm just very, very excited. I love 
baby piglets. They're so cute. And uh, so very, very excited to have those piglets here on the farm. All right, before we head on over to this week's Charting the Course, I did just want to make a few announcements. First of all, I had mentioned, I believe it was last week or the week before, that I was planning on doing a Canning with Confidence course. I have it planned out. I had every intention of doing that. And unfortunately, it does not seem like I'm going to be able to get that in this month. Um, I have some family coming into town, uh, visiting, and I haven't seen them in several years. So I want to spend as much time with them as possible. And then to make matters worse, we also discovered that the line going to the ice maker on our freezer has been leaking unbeknownst to us. And so I have a bit of a mess down in the basement to clean up. And so that just adds another level of complexity to things. And so I was kind of looking at when I could do this and the last week of June is just not going to work. And then we get into July 4th weekend. And then after that, I've got so much stuff going on in July that uh, it's going to be a miracle if I can get podcasts out on time. So unfortunately, I'm going to have to reschedule that training. I apologize. I am so very sorry. Um, but life has just happened and, uh, it, it is what it is. So I will keep you posted as to when I can get that rescheduled. I, I really wanted to do it in June because I, I know that people are getting ready to get into the canning, uh, spirit, the spirit of canning. <laughs> and, and so again, I just really, really apologize folks. Um, but it is what it is. Life has happened. And so as soon as I have uh, an opportunity to deliver that training, I certainly will. I did also want to give a quick plug for our membership area. If you are interested in becoming a supporting member of this podcast, head on over to support.thehomesteadjourney.net. Find out more information there, and uh, we'd be glad to have you. I'd really appreciate it. Every small bit does help me keep doing what I'm doing. All right, let's head on over to this week's charting the course. So as I shared with you just a little bit ago, I did my initial inspection on Saturday of the latest litter of piglets that we had here on the farm. And I thought that for this episode, it would be helpful and it might be fun if I explained a little bit about what I look for in pigs not just at that initial inspection, but at subsequent inspections and as they grow on out. Now, I do want you to keep in mind that I have only been doing this since 2017. I still have a lot to learn. I am not a geneticist. I'm not a zoologist. I'm not any other kind of ist. <laughs> I'm just a guy who has pigs. Um, but there are certain traits that I look for in my animals and that I breed for. Now, I think that it's important to keep in mind that not every breeding program is created equal. And, and that's not a bad thing. I, I don't mean it to sound like it's a bad thing. Um, it's certainly not a knock on other breeders. The fact is, each farm and each farmer, each breeding program is going to have certain characteristics or certain uh, traits that they are looking for, that they're breeding for. And that is great because that provides a certain diversity to the gene pool that I think is very, very helpful for the breed. Now, when I talk about this, I, I want you to understand that I prefer, I, I advocate very strongly uh, on behalf of heritage breeds and breeding purebred animals. Um, I understand why people do crosses, and I'm certainly not knocking that. But I also think that maintaining a purebred option is very, very key. And the Livestock Conservancy is, is a, a great resource if you want more information with regards to why heritage breeds and, and maintaining that purebred heritage breed is important. They have a, a wealth of information there. I'll go ahead and uh, provide a link to, to them in the, uh, in the show notes. Um, but just from, from a very simple perspective, 
it just stands to reason that if you do not have a purebred option, then eventually you're going to lose the ability to do crosses. So if, if everybody started doing crosses and nobody maintained uh, the American guinea hog breed, eventually the breed's going to go extinct. And that's actually what almost happened to it uh, back in the, in the uh, late 90s, um, early 2000s. So I definitely am a strong advocate of purebred in, in concert with an association, um, not just saying, well, it's purebred, but you can't eat the papers. Like to me, that's, I understand why people say it. I think it's a very, very weak argument because I think there's so much benefit to having those papers so that you know lineage, you know, um, you know, kind of the background of the animals. But I also understand that when you are breeding purebred animals, the papers can only tell you so much. Yeah, you can look at it and say, well, this sow and this boar created this offspring. And, and, the, and in, their, in their lineage, you know, there was this sow and this boar and, and so on and so forth. But going back to what I said earlier, when you have a breeder that is breeding for particular traits or particular characteristics, I think it's very important to have a conversation with that breeder before you buy an animal to understand what they are pursuing so that you understand whether or not that animal is going to be a good fit for your farm and for your breeding program. One of the other things, especially in the American guinea hog um, realm, and I was guilty of this when I first got into it, is people focus a lot on COI. Now, COI is coefficient of inbreeding. In other words, that's to look at how closely related the pigs are. Well, that can be a good indicator to ensure that you are not introducing weaknesses that come as a result of genetic abnormalities especially in the area of the guinea hog, we, uh, we come from a spot where everybody is very closely related from the get-go. So the COI to a certain extent can be a little bit misleading, but if you do intentional line breeding, you can also breed for certain characteristics as long as you don't get too heavily line bred, but you can breed for certain characteristics and those characteristics will come to the top much quicker if you are doing line breeding. Now, line breeding is when you would breed a father to a daughter or a mother to a son or, or something along those lines, or um, maybe a, 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 a brother to a sister. Then there's some combinations that you're technically not supposed to do, um, but sometimes you do it as an experiment to see what you get. And, and then as you register these pigs, you should always only register the good ones anyhow. So you may do a pairing, and, it, and this could stand a reason even if they aren't directly related. You could pair a boar and a sow and end up with characteristics or confirmation that you just don't like. So a lot of this is just experimentation anyhow. But certainly COI isn't everything. Sometimes line breeding can be a good thing. You just need to keep an eye out for abnormalities and weaknesses. So with that little bit of background, with regards to my perspective on breeding, and it's certainly not comprehensive, and there are people who are far smarter than I am when it comes to those kinds of things. What do I breed for? What do I look for in my pigs? Well, the first thing is, is I look at piglets and I want to make sure that they match the breed description. Now, I don't want to get too much in the weeds here, but the American guinea hog is a land race breed. What that means is there is no breed standard. There's a lot of variation. If you study into American guinea hogs, you'll find that there are small bone, there are big boned. Um, there, there's a lot of variation within the breed. We've never standardized it to say that this breed has to have um, this particular body type, this particular snout type, this particular whatever. Um, they just, there's a breed description that says that they should be black with minimal white. They can have a little bit of white, but they, they shouldn't have a lot of white. Um, you know, they shouldn't have spots. If there's spots, that is an indicator that they, they've got something else in them. And so um, there's a breed description 
um, that I'm not going to go through line by line. It's available on the American Guinea Hog website. I, I invite you to take a look at that. But uh, I certainly, that's a, a starting point for me. If the pig doesn't look like a, an American Guinea Hog, then I certainly don't want to include that in future breeding plans. The second thing that I look at is confirmation. Now, confirmation is just a fancy word to say the general body shape or the general look of the pig. You want the pig to look like a pig. Um, and some people, there are certain aspects that they are that are more important than others. Some people want a long snout. Some people want a short snout. Some people want them to be uh, a longer pig. Some people want them to be a shorter pig. Some people want them to be a rounder pig. Um, it kind of just depends on what the breeder is looking for. For me, for me, some of the important things that I look at are the quantity of nipples. I want to make sure that if I'm going to breed this animal or I'm going to use the male as a breeder, that the nipples that they have, that characteristic trait, is going to be such that they could potentially nurse, the, the offspring can nurse. So I want to make sure that they have enough nipples to do that job. I also look for evenly spaced nipples. Now, this isn't critical to me. I will breed uh, a pig if it has unevenly spaced nipples, but having even spacing just means that it makes it easier for the pigs to kind of line up at the milk bar. <laughs> I'm also wanting to make sure they don't have inverted nipples. Now, inverted nipples are basically dud nipples. They're, as the word implies, they're inverted. And so the piglet that gets kind of assigned to that nipple would starve because that nipple is not going to provide any milk. In the males, I check for the number of testicles. I have, do they have two? Um, if they only have one or they have none, that's a problem. Um, and if that keeps popping up over and over and over again, then you might want to look at the pairings. You might want to look at the, you know, maybe a different boar, a different sow. Um, the other thing is you certainly don't want to um, keep a, a boar that had only one testicle drop in with females, because even if you castrate, you take that one testicle, if they have that other testicle up inside them, they could go ahead and breed a female. And then at that point you have piglets that you don't necessarily want because that's not a trait that you would want to pass on. I also look for a straight or slightly arched back. I, I'm not looking for a dip. Even though Boris, my boar does have a bit of a dip in his back. Uh, I'm okay with that because if I pair him with a, a sow that has a strong back line, maybe a little bit of an arch or straight back, then that can compensate for that little bit of a dip because there are other characteristics about Boris that I do like. Um, and then another thing that I look at, do they have sound feet or pasterns? And that's something that's a little bit more difficult to evaluate on pasture raised pigs because they're not standing on even surfaces. So that can be a little bit tricky to evaluate. The third thing that I'm looking at is temperament. And when I say this is the third thing, we'll talk in a little bit as far as order of importance for me. But temperament is, is very key. Are they chill when they're handled? Is the sow too aggressive when she has piglets? And I want a certain level of aggressiveness. Uh, I, I wouldn't call it aggressiveness. I, I want a certain protective mothering instinct there. Don't get me wrong. Um, but I certainly don't want them to be overly aggressive on the other hand, I don't want them to be overly passive either. And then hardiness is another thing that's key for me. I do not intervene much with my pigs. Um, and, the, and, and the reason being, and again, folks, I'm not saying that I'm going to allow an animal to be sick and die, but especially with piglets, if there's a runt piglet, I am not going to take that piglet and bottle feed it and then turn around and breed that because I don't want to perpetuate weak genetics into my herd. I want American guinea hogs that are like the old time American guinea hogs, where they will feral without human in intervention, um, where they are, they are hardy, they can withstand temperatures uh, that fluctuate um, and so on and so forth. I want a very, very hardy pig. In fact, uh, as you may remember back in the early spring, Sage had her litter and uh, it was totally my fault i didn't keep track of things as well as i should have she had them out in the elements and only one piglet survived 
that piglet automatically for me went high on my list of ones that I was going to consider keeping as breeding stock. Because if that piglet can survive being born in those conditions, those are the kind of genetics that I want in my herd. The good news was when I examined that piglet, she had the confirmation that I look, I'm look i looking for. She had the temperament I'm looking for. And so she's one of the piglets that actually has gone to Beardsley Zoo over in Connecticut to be a part of that breeding program. But that hardiness is something that is extremely important to me. Now, I will tell you a few things that I do not breed for. I do not breed for fast growth. And that's kind of sounds funny coming from a pig farmer. But the reason why I do not breed for fast growth, although it would be in my interest from a financial perspective to breed for faster growth, but the reason why I don't is out of respect to the tradition of the American guinea hog. The American guinea hog was never intended to be a fast growing pig. And so if I were to breed for faster growth, even though it might benefit me commercially, it doesn't really benefit the breed, in my opinion. And there are others who have bred for faster growth, don't get me wrong, but it doesn't benefit the breed, in my opinion, for its historical purposes. I also don't focus on body length. Now, while I say don't focus on body length, generally speaking, the more teats an animal has, the longer in body length it might be. But I certainly don't focus on that and say, I want a longer pig because I want more bacon. That doesn't really factor into my decision with regards to whether or not I'm going to breed this animal or not. So when I do the initial inspection, which we just did um, this past Saturday, I do that as soon as I can, within two or three days, and sometimes sooner, if I have sows that uh, have litters on the ground at the same time, I'm, I'm trying to get in there as quickly as possible so that piglets aren't being swapped from sow to sow um, before I get to identify them. Um, it's very, very important from a registration process. In order to understand the, the pedigree of that pig, you need to identify it as quickly as possible. So I try to do the initial inspection as quickly as possible. During that initial inspection, what I'm looking at is I'm looking to find out how many boys or girls we have. I am counting nipples and evaluating spacing. I'm looking to see, and it's at that early stage, sometimes it can be hard to tell whether or not nipples are inverted or not. But if I see any indication that a nipple might be inverted, I note that down. Uh, I evaluate how chill or not chill the pig is. Uh, I count the testicles on the boys. Now, this first pass, sometimes the testicles haven't dropped. And I don't stress about that. Um, it's no big deal from the first couple of days, the testicles haven't dropped. I don't worry about that. Um, but eventually the testicles have to drop, but I, I will count the testicles and then we notch ears um, to identify them. So that way I know that piglet one from litter 11 was a female, 12 nipples, evenly spaced, chill personality, boom, done. And I keep all of this in a Google spreadsheet. At about six to eight weeks, I will do my second evaluation. Um, at this time, what I'm looking for, I'm verifying the nipples and the spacing. Uh, again, I'm looking at whether or not nipples are inverted or not. Um, I'm reevaluating the personality of the pig. Is the pig still chill? Is it not chill? Is it, um, you know, what? But I'm, I'm reevaluating the chill level <laughs> of the pig. Uh, I'm also at this point, looking closer at the confirmation and adherence to breed description. I really don't focus a lot on that in the initial inspection. Um, some, you know, a little bit, but at that, at that, especially if they're, they've just been born, then it really doesn't make sense to really focus on um, shape because they've just gotten pushed through a tube like a watermelon. <laughs> so you got to give them a little time to kind of even out before you start making those decisions. So six, to eight weeks, I will start looking at confirmation and adherence to the breed description. Again, I will check testicles on the boys at this point. Um, if, if, uh, 
they haven't both dropped, I, I'm a bit concerned um, because if I'm not keeping these uh, boys as breeding stock, and it's very rare that I do, uh, then the boys will be castrated. And so I want to be able to castrate uh, and take both, both testicles. Um, if not, then at that point, I know that I'm going to have to separate that boy from the girls uh, to ensure that he does not breed them. And usually I will harvest those pigs early. And then once I've gone through, I've done that second evaluation, they are ear tagged. Um, so now I have an identifier that uh, matches with the ear notching. And at that point, I pretty much know, I have a good indicator as far as which ones are going to be breeding stock and which ones are going to be eating stock. So as I'm doing my evaluations, really for me, in order of importance, I'm first of all looking for pigs that look like American guinea hogs. So breed description is of paramount importance. If it doesn't look like an American guinea hog, then I'm not even considering it for breeding purposes. The second thing that I am considering is hardiness. If it's something that's weak, I don't care how well it looks, I am not going to consider introducing those genetics and risk introducing weakness into my herd or into somebody else's herd. Then after that is temperament. I want sweet, docile pigs. I do not want to have an animal on this farm that I have to be afraid of or that I have to worry about my wife and son being around. And so the old adage is you breed the sweet ones, you eat the mean ones. And that's really the hallmark of the American guinea hog. The American guinea hog is known as a sweet, docile pig. And so I always want to be mindful of that. That really goes back to the breed description and ensuring that I am breeding for that characteristic very, very uh, conscientiously. After that, then I start taking into consideration confirmation. So if I have a pig that looks like an American guinea hog that is very hardy, and has a great temperament, if maybe they've got unevenly spaced nipples, I still might consider breeding it. If they're a little on the smaller size, and, and again, if they're a little bit on the smaller side, and again, I don't really focus too much on growth rate. Maybe I should focus more on that, but I don't. Um, but I, in fact, Betswine Ross um, is a much smaller pig than her mom or her aunt. But I chose to breed her because she is an extremely sweet pig. She has one of the best dispositions of any pig I've ever had. And so I wanted to keep that temperament in my herd. And if that meant that I ended up with a bit of a smaller pig, well, then so be it. Hopefully by maybe some other breeding that I do, maybe breeding back to her dad, um, I'll get some size. And, and, and again, keep in mind, folks, in the American guinea hog, there is so much variation with regards to size anyhow. But simply saying that confirmation to me is the least important. It's not to say that it isn't important, but I would consider breeding a pig that had unevenly spaced nipples, for example, if she has a great disposition, she's a hardy pig, and she looks like an American guinea hog should look. So th those are kind of the things that are important to me. Breed description is number one, hardiness, temperament, and then confirmation. So I hope you found this helpful. Again, folks, I am not an expert. There are people who are far more knowledgeable on these kinds of things than I am. If you have any other interest in this, whether it's maybe at a higher level, then I would recommend you check out the Livestock Conservancy. If you are interested in American guinea hogs and breeding um, them, then definitely check out the American guinea hog website. It's uh, guineahogs.org. I'll put that link in the show notes or check out, there's some great American guinea hog Facebook groups and also groups on MeWe dedicated to the American guinea hog. Great people there, far more knowledgeable than I am when it comes to breeding and they would be happy to answer your questions. I will guarantee you that. If you do have any questions, feel free to reach out to me, brian at thehomesteadjourney.net. I love talking pigs. 
Um, I, I love the American guinea hog. I, I think you're well aware of that now. And so I'd be more than glad to have a conversation and answer any questions. Um, and if you disagree with me, if you think I'm, I'm wrong on any of this stuff, um, I'm always trying to learn. And so definitely reach out to me again, Brian at the homesteadjourney.net. I would be more than happy to hear from you. Brian can be reached by emailing him at brian at thehomesteadjourney.net or by contacting him via our social media accounts on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube. If you've enjoyed this episode and you'd like to support this podcast, we invite you to become a member of the Supporting Listeners Program. For $10 a month or $100 per year, you will receive access to a community of like-minded individuals via a private Facebook group, at least one monthly live Q&A with Brian, the opportunity to participate in live recordings of the podcast, access to an ever-expanding library of helpful homesteading content, and so much more. Head on over to support.thehomesteadjourney.net for more information and to sign up today. As always, the music on this episode was provided by audionautics.com. So a big shout out to them. And until next time, everybody, keep up the good work.